All right, we have the last, not the least, uh, presentation coming up in this morning block. Um, it's going to be a presentation by Stefan George. He's the CTO and one of the co-founders of Gnosis. It's actually a nice bracket that we have this morning. Uh, Martin, was, uh, Martin from Gnosis was uh, kicking off Debcon with the opening speech. Uh, now we have uh, Stefan concluding uh, the first morning block. Um, he's going to be talking about Gnosis chain and extending Ethereum and what they actually mean by a layer 1.5. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, I'm Stefan George, uh, and today I would like to talk to you about Gnosis Chain. Um, so, for those of you who have never heard about Gnosis Chain, you might actually have used Gnosis Chain anyways, <laughs> uh, because many of the applications that are running on top of Gnosis Chain are obfuscating very well that they are running on top of Gnosis Chain. So to give you a few examples, if you have played this game here before, this is a Dark Forest game, um, like space exploration game. I spent way too many hours on this. <laughs> uh, if you played this game before, then actually you have been operating on Gnosis Chain. This morning we had a talk by Patricio about Poops. And uh, if you have some of your some of uh, some props collected in your wallet, then very likely they were actually issued on Gnosis Chain. So again, you actually already did transactions on Gnosis Chain. And last but not least, um, if you were like using Circles in the past and created a Circles account, you also operated on Gnosis Chain. All those transactions were all mined and uh, secured on Gnosis Chain. So what is Gnosis Chain about? So Gnosis Chain has actually quite some history. It was not known as Gnosis Chain in the past. Actually, it was known as XDAI. And the genesis goes back to Berlin, to East Berlin in 2018, uh, when Igor had the idea of uh, creating a sidechain to Ethereum, which would use DAI, the stablecoin DAI, as the token to pay transaction fees. And the uh, reason for this was quite simple, like improving the user experience by not requiring users who interact with apps that require just a stablecoin to have two tokens in their wallet, like you would have on Ethereum. Uh, like if you want to use an app on Ethereum that requires DAI, then you still need Ether in order to pay for transaction fees. This is not the case for XDAI. You just need DAI and you can do whatever you want. And it's not a surprise, like one of the most uh, popular applications in the early days of XDAI was the Burner Wallet. Some of you might know it was a very simple, uh, easy to use browser based wallet that allowed you to pay for food and drinks and Ethereum events like this here. And uh, it was actually a very nice, very easy user experience to even onboard your parents to blockchain without them having to understand a lot what's going on under the surface. So last year, the course of XDAI changed quite a bit. Uh, we did a merger like Gnosis and XDAI merged together. Uh, like the stake token, which was a token of the XDAI network, was converted to GNO, like stake token holders were able to convert their stake to GNO. And um, yeah, in addition to the token merger, we also changed the technical roadmap of XDAI uh, to deprecate their own consensus algorithm, which is Aura consensus, and to follow the Ethereum 2 roadmap, applying Ethereum 2 uh, to, um, yeah, to XDAI, which was renamed to Gnosis Chain. And one of the first actions that were done uh, was to actually launch the equivalent to the Ethereum beacon chain, the Gnosis beacon chain, in a slightly different setting, uh, making it easy for everyone to join. And yeah, the Gnosis beacon chain is still obviously operational, up running, and now it's a very much anticipated event for us as well to do the merge of Gnosis beacon chain and the Gnosis execution layer. So how do we see Gnosis chain uh, relating to Ethereum? Well, obviously, we are using the same technology now. So we are, we are funding the same teams, we are contributing to the same technology, and we hope that a lot of the work that we are doing will eventually also uh, help Ethereum to evolve as well. Uh, we, don't, we see the yeah, relationship as a symbiosis between those two networks. Obviously, Ethereum has become quite expensive to operate. A lot of use cases have been priced out on Ethereum, and we hope we can give those use cases a new home on Gnosis Chain. So, to describe 
the technical aspects of Gnosis Chain, I would like to use the uh, blockchain trilemma. It's a term that was, I think, coined by Vitalik. It describes that all of the three desired properties a blockchain has or should have, being decentralized, being secure, and being scalable, you can really only optimize for two of them, and you have to make compromises on one of them. And I know many so-called Ethereum killers, they claim they can actually <laughs> fulfill all of this, but in fact, they make uh, usually very, uh, very big compromises uh, on some of them. So let's see how this applies to Gnosis Chain. First, starting with decentralization. So our goal is to make Gnosis Chain the most decentralized network. If you look at stakers.info, then you see that right now the Gnosis Beacon Chain has about 100,000 validators. Uh, Ethereum has about 400,000 validators. In the end, it is just a number. Uh, it's an important number, but it's not the only important number. What is also important is to understand how is the stake distributed, how are the validators distributed, what is the diversity of validators, is all of this controlled by a single entity? How many entities are there? How are they geographically distributed? And all of this adds up to actually create a resilient decentralized network. And uh, for us, decentralization is very, very important. That's why we are in the space since the early days. This is why Ethereum was created to create a really decentralized network. Most of the, yeah, I feel like most of the competitors to Ethereum or like many that operate in the space, they don't value decentralization that much, actually. I can kind of echo what I think Edu described in, in his talk about that note that, um, well, we kind of sometimes forget why decentralization matters. It's not only about censorship resistance, it's also about creating permissionless uh, innovation. And yeah, we value this very highly at Gnosis, and that's why we want to contribute to this, and we want to make sure that Gnosis chain is highly decentralized. And uh, that's also what we took into, co uh, into account when we designed the setup for our own beacon chain. So again, like the Ethereum, uh, the Gnosis beacon chain is using the same technology as the Ethereum beacon chain, but we changed uh, the parameters of how this chain operates or can be operated. And one important change is that we, for example, changed the minimum requirement for participating in Gnosis Chain, you only need one GNO, which is about $160, $170, versus in Ethereum, you need right now like 32 Ether, which I think, based on today's price, is something like $50,000. Um, we also uh, have like non punitive uptime requirements, so if you go offline for a while, it doesn't really harm you at all. And we um, made sure that it's really easy for you to start your own node. We actually collaborated with Depnode for a very long time already, for many years, to create a software that allows you to easily spin up your own node and participate in validating the network. And we also incentivized this quite heavily. So we gave, and we are still giving, GNO tokens to everyone who is purchasing such a hardware device, as you can see here, uh, to have your own computer that you can set up at home. And uh, yeah, you, can, you will receive some GNO tokens, which you can use to start validating the network. Well, it's still kind of mind-blowing to me that everyone globally can just buy this device and actually participate in decentralizing this network. And yeah, again, like this is really the number one metric that we want to optimize Gnosis Chain for in the next few months, making sure that it's a super decentralized, super resilient network, uh, that we have a big uh, diversity in nodes and people running nodes. And yeah, one metric I think Martin already mentioned this morning is we would like to have one person in each country on this planet to run a node and participate in decentralizing this network. So there's a slight downside of, of this kind of setup, which is we have already a lot of uh, non-professional stakers, a lot of hobbyists that are running their nodes. And uh, they sometimes are maybe in a setup where, they're not where the node is not always available. And you can see that on Gnosis Chain, we are missing a few blocks. So if you see um, yeah, how many blocks you miss, is about something like 10%, maybe 15%, whereas on Ethereum, it's just 1%. Does this really matter? Not that much. It just matters that the capacity of the Gnosis Chain is a little bit, lim like, a little bit lower than it could be when you had higher. Uh, uptimes, um, but it doesn't really matter. In the worst case, you have to wait maybe one more block uh, in order for your transaction to be included, or like wait a bit longer until the block is actually mined. So it doesn't really matter that much. So let's look at the next property. 
security. So security is derived from decentralization. And yeah, there's yeah, two ways you can compromise the security. One is uh, well, yeah, the famous 51% attack. When you control 51% of the network and you have 51% of the tokens, then you can eventually compromise this network. The other is to actually try to attack uh, stakers and uh, validator services to try to compromise their stake and uh, take over the network. Um, this has been a concern uh, and has been discussed quite widely recently, also within the Ethereum community on Twitter and other social media, uh, because of the chart that you can see in the top. It just shows like um, yeah, how how much of the stake has been deposited by which entities. And you can clearly see that the Alido is kind of the dominating party right now. Uh, but we also have some centralized exchanges, such as Kraken and Binance, which are really dominating this right now. Is this really a concern? Well, probably for now, it's not really a big concern, because well, all of those uh, companies are highly professionalized. They uh, have amazing OPSEC. Uh, it's super, super unlikely that they'll be compromised. Is this good for optics? Uh, probably not. It doesn't look really great. And of course, there's still like a small chance that something can go wrong. And we should aim for having something that is a lot more uh, distributed. So to be fair, <laughs> like Gnosis chain is just below. And you can see uh, we kind of run into the same issues. Uh, so we have here the biggest ones, actually also liquid uh, staking provider, stake-wise on Gnosis chain. Um, then we have like one large whale. But then you can see. Like everyone else, like about 50% is pretty nicely distributed among many different parties. And our goal is to yeah, even get it more distributed, get more providers on there, and uh, have something that looks a lot more diverse than it does today. So one reason also why this validator set is very important to us is uh, the bridge between Ethereum and Gnosis Chain. So today, if you look at the multi-chain ecosystem that we are in, then the Achilles heel of the ecosystem are bridges. Like most of them are at most like glorified multi-signature wallets. And uh, to be honest, Gnosis Chain is no exception. <laughs> uh, Gnosis Chain, like the, the uh, bridge between Gnosis Chain and Ethereum, even though it's very innovative, it is still, in the end, a multi-sig. And in the end, you depend on very few parties that have to collude in order to compromise everything that's going on in this network. And that should not be the case, right? Like, we don't want this. We don't want anyone to compromise decentralization on this, uh, at this uh, angle. And um, that's why we started collaborating with the team at Zero X Park. It's a research collective working on ZK technology to build the first uh, beacon chain uh, light client using ZK technology. So previously, it was considered uh, pretty much impo impossible to do this because uh, there is no BLS precompile available on an execution client, and if you want to simulate or like have a light client running on another network, it would cost enormous amount of gas. Now, thanks to zk technology, we are able to outsource these, comp these, these uh, computation into zk snark and are able to verify this um, on Gnosis chain and vice versa also on Ethereum. So we can build actually a light client-based bridge. And in simple terms, what does this mean? Like we. We rely on the honesty of the Sync Committee, which is 512 validators, uh, out of which I think 60% have to confirm. So in simple terms, it's like we upgrade the multisig, which currently I think uh, consists of 11, uh, of 11 owners, to a multisig which has 512 owners, <laughs> which are shuffled uh, every like 256 epochs, which is approximately every 27 hours, um, to yeah, validate what's going on on this bridge. So let's look a bit deeper. What does this again actually mean? So what does a light client actually do? So the light client that we are building right now allows us to verify that we are on what is called the canonical chain. Yeah, so you see this uh, small diagram here. We have a blockchain with block number 1, 2, 3, and then 3a. And uh, canonical chain basically shows you like, what, are, like, what is the top of the chain. Is this 3 or 3a? And that's something that we can verify uh, with the ZK light client that we're building right now. What this does not allow you to do is to make sure that there are no invalid state transitions in this bridge being confirmed. And this is quite important, because if you would have invalid state transitions, then you would obviously also uh, be able to compromise anything that's going on 
uh, in this bridge, and yeah, funds could be stolen, and yeah, the security would be compromised. So fortunately, there is a new technology coming up, which we, are, we find very promising, which could help to complement this, which is ZKEVM. And what does ZKEVM do? It does allow you to verify uh, state transitions uh, in the ZK snark itself. So we can actually know that the state is correct. We don't only know that we are following the right chain, but we also know we are following the right state transition. And this has big implications. So what does this mean if we, if we kind of uh, combine those two very uh, promising technologies? It basically lifts the security of this bridge to a level where it is equivalent to a ZK rollup on Gnosis chain, uh, on, on Ethereum. So that's why we are kind of thinking about the term of how, what we should apply to, to name this technology. We came up with layer 1.5. Uh, if you have a better idea, let me know. <laughs> it's still, still very early. But yeah, effectively, what we're able to do is we have a separate network that runs uh, in parallel to Ethereum. But all the communication going on between Ethereum and Gnosis chain, arbitrary messages uh, like token transfers relayed over this bridge, they are uh, highly secured, so, like with the similar security guarantees or the same security guarantees as you would have if you operate uh, on a ZK rollup on top of Ethereum. And uh, the great thing is our technology is already available today, like you can operate on it. And this bridge is, uh, of course, like a very important missing uh, piece that we can now start rolling out slowly. Um, like the first prototype for the light client based part is actually already um, uh, operating on the test network of Ethereum uh, on Gnosis chain. And hopefully we can make it soon operational also on Gnosis chain itself. So this is like a pretty big deal. Most people, I think, haven't understood the potential of this. Uh, but effectively, it allows us to have many, many uh, networks operating using beacon chain consensus and be able to have uh, like secure communication between those. And yeah, this can actually change, I would say, the landscape um, of yeah, how blockchain networks operate quite significantly. Obviously, there's a lot of heavy lifting required. The KEVM itself is still very, very new. Um, um, I'm very excited to hear about Jordi's update, who is working on this at Polygon. Uh, there's also an interesting panel going on, I think, on, on Wednesday with a surprise guest <laughs> uh, that I recommend you all attending. So I'm really running out of time, so I have to rush a little bit. Let's look at the last part, scalability. Now, I kind of already hinted that yeah, decentralization security is very important to us, so obviously we kind of have to compromise on, on scalability. However, we try to push as far as we can on scalability without having to compromise uh, on decentralization and security. And that's why we have been investing and working closely together with the Aragon team uh, for the last couple of years uh, to, to build the most effective and most efficient EVM-based client. And we're very happy that they have a dedicated team um, which is optimizing this client to be operational for Gnosis Chain. And what is the consequence of this? Well, simple consequence is that we can increase the computational capacity of what Gnosis Chain can process from about 30 million today to about 100 million without having to make any sacrifices in terms of how decentralized and secure the network is. So in, it is not like the overall scalability solution. It's not like we have unlimited computational space, but yeah, we get about eight times of what you can do on Ethereum today. That also implies that uh, we have to use other technologies as well in order to improve the uh, uh, computational um, yeah, capacity. So we are also very much convinced about layer two. In fact, optimism is already running today on Gnosis chain. Hardly anyone knows. But yeah, the latest version of the Dark Forest game actually operates on optimism uh, on Gnosis chain. And yeah, a few more interesting applications upcoming, which will also operate on optimism or other layer twos on top of Gnosis chain. So this kind of sums up the technical part. Let's look, uh, look at like, what's actually running on this network today. So today we have a lot of like, different, especially DAOs running on top of Gnosis chain became kind of the home for many DAOs simply because there's a lot of DAO tooling available, especially also our own tooling. Zodiac is optimized also to run on Gnosis chain. 
Uh, we have a lot of social applications like uh, Circle CBI, uh, Proof of Humanity, uh, to provide like an ident like identity layer on top of Gnosis Chain, where we hope that many other applications can build on top of. We have social dApps like uh, Poop that was already mentioned, CLR Fund. We have games like the Dark Forest, uh, sports betting with Azuro, uh, and many, many other applications uh, which you can enjoy. And uh, I recommend everyone to try out. Um, what's also exciting to look at what is coming to Gnosis Chain. So Circles is a very important part to this. So if you have never tried Circles, um, yeah, it's like a universal basic income, which also creates a social graph at the same time. So it's kind of, it's like, it's a UBI, but at the same time you create a social network. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're very excited about this too, and have now multiple teams actually working on this. On the last day, you will see, I think one stage is purely dedicated to Circles UBI, so you should definitely take a look at what's going on and how it will influence Gnosis Chain in the future. Another project I want to mention, I mean, there are many projects coming, but the two that I want to mention, the other one is a payment network. Uh, there's a presentation actually later today uh, at 2 o'clock, um, like how we want to build a decentralized payment network on Gnosis Chain. It's an effort which is uh, pretty significant, and uh, it's obviously like one of these like, early use cases that have never been really fulfilled, surprisingly. I mean, it was in the Bitcoin white paper. <laughs> Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system should be a payment system today. Until today, unfortunately, there is no payment system, even though it's such an obvious use case. And yeah, we are trying to, to actually make this a reality, and I would recommend you guys to check out this talk later today. So yeah, this is it for Gnosis Chain. You can uh, find a lot more information online. Um, also, Gnosis Chain is operated through Gnosis DAO, which is an open uh, yeah, an open DAO for everyone to join. Uh, so we are happy to hear your thoughts and your proposals on our forum. And uh, yeah, would be happy to work with you guys. Thank you. I'm sorry I run over time. <laughs> we still have time. Okay, still have time for questions. So ah, okay, great. Questions. Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, the XDAI token is backed, backed by DAI on mainnet. Right. And DAI is largely backed by USDC. And in light of the recent event, is that a threat to either security or decentralization of the Gnosis chain? Yeah, that's a good question. So we are, we are very closely following what's going on at Maker and the different initiatives that they are taking. Uh, they are now also considering to eventually depack from, uh, US, from, yeah, from USD, which I think also makes sense. So yeah, for now, we are following very closely. And of course, eventually it is possible uh, to change also the token, which is used for fee payments. Um, we haven't done like a full technical analysis on this. Uh, it requires a few things to be done. I mean, everything can be done. It's all like technology only, but uh, yeah, we, we will see. We will talk to, we are in constant discussions with Maker, also for different reasons. Um, but yeah, like in, in case we see that there's uh, actual like strong risk of centralization, then of course it's not, uh, not in line with our mission and then we will have to consider other options. Any further questions? There's one more. Somewhat related to the last question, are there plans for private or shielded transactions, or what is the kind of privacy base layer plans for Gnosis Chain? Right, yeah, so yeah, we are a big fan of privacy tools, and we have been also supporting them. Um, so also the Tornado Cash team is very close to us. Uh, of course, we have to be, um, like, we want to embrace it, so we, I think we, we are in talks also with different privacy layers, like AdStack, um, and, and others, and there's not like one clear master plan at this point. Um, my view is also we should just try to embrace all of them. <laughs> Ideally, we have like a like an ad sec roll up on top of Gnosis Chain, 
Um, we actually also are like working with a, another company called Mystico, which builds like a ZK kind of based bridge. Also, the perspective of our own ZK based bridge obviously also opens the door to to create privacy directly in the bridge itself. So there are right now like many different initiatives, and uh, I think at this point we we just want to support all of them <laughs> uh, to see uh, how they develop and. Uh, Ideally, we can get even to a level where like every transaction that's done on Gnosis chain is, is actually a private transaction, because I think that's also kind of the issue with Tornado Cash right now, is if you look at like, hey, who are the main users of this technology, yeah, then unfortunately the top 10 users are uh, Black Hat hackers and Vitalik. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we have to make sure that those, uh, those technologies become ubiquitous, that they're used everywhere, and then the number one use case is not Money laundering is just like everyone doing simple transactions, and I think that's also where we want to go. Oh yeah, let's do one more question. Hello. Uh, we, heard, we know a lot of DAOs run on Gnosis chain. What other kind of applications do you want to attract on your chain? For example, do you also look at enterprise use cases? So for, uh, one thing that's for me pretty obvious is that we have to get more real world use cases. I feel like over the last seven years we have been building crypto for crypto people and it's really important. And I think it's also the biggest potential to get more real world use cases. That's why I think also, for example, this payment network is something where we have a very clear connection uh, to, the, yeah, to the real world. And this obviously in involves a lot of enterprises as well. Like it, the only reason why this is possible is because we collaborate with enterprises that uh, can add, uh, add to this. And I feel also a lot of like, real world use cases are so difficult because it's not a technology problem, right? Like we can solve technology. That's why we've been solving a lot of technological problems in the last seven years. But in order to actually touch the real world, you have to talk to regulators, you have to uh, embrace a lot of like, other like, parties which we usually don't want to talk to. <laughs> well, like, it uh, can, be, can be painful. Uh, and, but that's, for me, obviously, that this has to happen. So if there's a really clear use case where you can see that it's sustainable uh, and it can allow a lot more users to operate on this network, then yes, we should do this. Thank you very much, Stefan. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>